quick disclaimer, this video is being made for psychological and educational commentary purposes only and is not intended to diagnose or treat. Resources for therapy are linked below. We currently live in a world where emotions can be capitalized on and many times used for someone else's advantage. And so the question always comes up for me in both the work that I do and also as a human being, how can and how does a person sift through the influx of information that we often receive to make decisions that feel healthy for them? And more importantly, to engage in critical thinking to be able to make decisions that feel healthy for a person. Today, I am going to be sharing with you one of my absolutely favorite concepts that at the very least, I think everyone should at least know about and maybe pull elements from that work for you in your life. But today I'm talking all about Socratic questioning. Where does it come from? What is it? And how does it enhance critical thinking skills? And why is that so important? Stay tuned, I'm about to break it all down. Welcome to my channel or welcome back to my channel if you're returning either way I am so happy that you're here I'm Rachel Ann I'm a licensed professional counselor and I make videos of psychological commentary on current events anti-scam high control cultic groups and spreading domestic violence awareness let's go ahead and get into the materials for today one of the reasons that I am really such a fan and even an advocate of Socratic questioning, and this is even something that I utilize with my clients in therapy, teaching them how to engage in Socratic questioning, is that it forces a person to really examine the beliefs that they have, the thoughts that they have, and because I really subscribe to the cognitive behavioral therapy model, I find that Cognitive Behavioral Therapy Socratic Questioning, which was adapted from Socrates' Socratic Method, can be a very helpful tool in helping a person to manage anxiety, to even question the information that they are receiving from other people, which can naturally help a person to think more critically, but even to make decisions that lead them into a place where they feel safer. They feel as if they have more autonomy. They're not just going along with something just to go along with it. Or they're not just allowing a negative belief or a negative thought of self to take them on a long, windy, dark path and journey. Instead, they're learning to take pause and question is this thought true? Is there concrete evidence to validate or invalidate this belief? So the Socratic method came from Socrates, which Socrates is an interesting figure in philosophical history. While he has been met with certain elements of criticism as pretty much everything in this world is, there were some pretty interesting concepts that he created and were recorded by his student, Plato's. I'm not gonna get too much into the historical background regarding Socrates. Instead, I wanna focus more so on defining what is a Socratic method and then even more deeply, what is Socratic questioning? The piece I really enjoy about the Socratic method, it encourages and fosters an environment where many different people come together to share thoughts and opinions. So differences of opinion are welcomed, which is really the antithesis of a high control cultic group or a controlling relationship, which are things I really don't like. And so naturally I'm always drawn to philosophical viewpoints and even therapeutic strategies and techniques that honor and meet a person where they are at. Socrates was in many ways known for fostering this open dialogue. In fact, he, for some, was considered a teacher, but he himself didn't always consider himself a teacher. Instead, what he tried to do is not come from a place of being all-knowing or having all of the answers, but instead to foster that conversation surrounding a question, a hypothetical that he posed to try to encourage his students to get to a place of finding what their own truth is. And so there are five typical pieces to the model of the Socratic method, which I am pulling from a great research article that I found in frontiers.org. 
I will link this article in the description below if you're like me and you like to nerd out and read everything that you can about things and kind of understand what the source is, which is also a great form of Socratic questioning and method. Question the source, understand where it comes from. But let me go ahead and share with you the five common steps of really almost the classic Socratic method approach. The first is the wonder question. So almost the muse. And this could be a hypothesis that somebody is posturing or stating. And so you're really identifying what is the wonder question. The second is the hypothesis. What are the thoughts surrounding the answer to the wonder question? The third is the elinkus refutation or the cross-examination. This could even be the part of the Socratic method or the dialogue where you're having other people of opposing viewpoints questioning you, not in a derogatory or trying to, you know, pull the rug out from under you type method that we often see in unhealthy relationships or in individuals who like to control that narrative, but more so in a way to encourage someone to examine their own beliefs. This is very much something that I like to do in individual therapy is to cross-examine in an open and collaborative way what causes a person to think what they are thinking. This piece of cross-examination can be exceptionally helpful for challenging negative thoughts of self. Sometimes the messages that we receive, whether it's from other people or the experiences that we have along the way in life can create what's called automatic thoughts where it's almost a reflexive thinking response to a situation that happens. And usually it's pretty self-deprecating. It's, it's usually a really hard thought of self. And by slowing this process down and challenging those negative or unhelpful thoughts and getting to those root cause origins of where does that thought come from? Is there concrete evidence to validate or invalidate that thought? Can be such a helpful exercise in really thinking critically about the information that you're taking in, so the thoughts that a person is having, maybe even the emotions. So it's really attempting to use a little bit of logic to balance emotional responses because a lot of times emotions can take us down that long, windy, dark path. Whereas if we look at the facts of a situation, it can bring us back to that present moment and help us recognize, oh, wait a second, this is unhelpful, really harmful messaging I received from my parent or a cult leader or somebody at my church. And I need to prove to myself that this is no longer my truth. This is not my reality. The cross-examination piece is very helpful because it allows a person to possibly not just accept everything as truth, which may sound strange and adversarial, but it's just an, an, an investigative process of viewing how you're feeling and the thoughts you're having. And so you can kind of start to trace that trigger. And when I say trace the trigger, I refer to whatever it is, that emotion that a person is feeling or the negative thought of self that one may be experiencing. So the third step in the Socratic method, as I just shared, is the Alinkus refutation or cross-examination. And then the fourth step is acceptance or rejection of the hypothesis. And the fifth step is action. So acceptance or rejection of the hypothesis is essentially where you're able to come to a determination that this is untrue. What can I do to reframe my thinking about it? How can I try to create a new internal narrative that I'm telling myself? Now, obviously, this is not an overnight process for many. In some cases, the utilization of the Socratic method may almost instantaneously alleviate symptoms of anxiety or self-doubt because you're able to logically think through a situation and come to your own determination that it doesn't actually make sense and there's nothing to back up why I'm feeling anxious right now. That last stage to me is also vitally important where you're able to actually examine the thoughts you're having and then decide 
how you want to move forward and take action. So maybe it becomes established, you know what, this group that I'm involved in or this person who I'm close to doesn't have my best interest at heart or they're teaching me some faulty, unhelpful teachings. What do I need to do with this information now that I've established to myself that, hey, this is not working for me, how do I take action? Do I disengage from the group? Do I start to explore other avenues of self-education and seeking understanding? Insert whatever that next step is. But either way, even if the hypothesis is confirmed, maybe it's even an anxiety that someone does not necessarily like you. And it's confirmed through careful thinking. You know what? Actually, there's all of these examples that show me they don't really care for me in the way that I need to be cared for. It gives you that information to then make that next decision on how can I take action to better protect myself or set healthy boundaries or insert whatever. It actually will give you that ability to start to engage in maybe a sense of acceptance of the situation. If this person doesn't care for me, why am I continuing to try to make this situation work? How can I set healthy mental and emotional boundaries to preserve my own time, my own energy, things of that nature, yet also honor who I am and what I need, which is essentially the fifth step of the Socratic method, and that is the taking of the action. Whether it is freeing yourself of an erroneous cognitive distortion that you may be experiencing, which is uh, a list of different thinking errors that we all have from time to time, whether it's black and white thinking, there's no gray, it's either good, bad, nothing in the middle, or maybe it is catastrophizing and blowing up a situation or disproportionately viewing a situation to make it much worse than it actually is. This can be symptomatic of anxiety or even depression, but identifying the thinking errors or the cognitive distortion then can allow a person to further take action. This can also all be applied to if you are considering joining a group or starting a new business. And I do really wish that potentially individuals who are considering joining, you know, a network marketing group that they would kind of go through the Socratic method. Maybe they do. I don't know. But many times groups of a high control nature dim down or they try to encourage a person to suppress their critical thinking skills, to suppress that asking of the questions or bringing up an opposing viewpoint. Because if you start doing that, it leads a person to think more deeply about what it is they're actually doing. And when it comes to high control relationships or groups or manipulative workplace environments, the last thing that one of those people necessarily wants you to do is to think more deeply or cross-examine an issue. They almost want you to just fall in line with whatever it is the group or the abusive partner wants you to believe or behaviorally do. To break this down even just a little bit further, I found another great research article called Cognitive Engagement and Questioning Online. And so I'll go through a couple questions just to keep in mind if you're interested in engaging in the Socratic method. This could be an interesting practice if you're in a group of people and you want to test out or understand if it is a groupthink situation that's going on where potentially because the group has been so cohesive or so in line with one another for so long that everyone believes the same or if it fosters really some interesting dialogue surrounding differences in opinion. We all naturally are going to have different opinions about what we believe in and even the ways that we believe people should behave or act, even the beliefs that we have about ourselves, whereas I could believe something about myself that's a negative thing, somebody else may think, I've never even thought that about you. How could you think that about yourself? And so I say that because Socratic method methoding. So the Socratic method can be a great practice either on your own terms with yourself 
or in a group of people. And the key here, uh, because I do want to mention that the Socratic method has in some ways gotten some criticism when it's used in the classroom setting, as you can see probably by my facial expression, I don't really agree with this. I, I think if done correctly, it would not do this, but it has received criticism that it humiliates and shames students and discourages them from freely speaking. This to me tells me that maybe the Socratic method in Socratic questioning is not being done correctly because it's not supposed to shame or humiliate anyone. Instead, it's supposed to almost come from a place of respectfully understanding that we all have different experiences and beliefs and are going to have different hypotheses and different thoughts about a situation at hand or a concept at hand. Not to mention, it also goes into helping a person think more critically about their own viewpoints and recognizing any fallacies or thinking errors, cognitive distortions that may be going on for the person who is listening to dialogue or questioning themselves. If you notice in a uh, relationship of any kind, whether it's a family relationship, which unfortunately I see this come up quite a bit, that if you don't think like the rest of the family does, then there's something wrong with you. And if you try to test out a hypothesis or maybe cross-examine a certain belief that the rest of your family unit has, then it could potentially be met with humiliation and shame. This isn't necessarily the healthiest way to navigate differences of opinion. Actually, it's not a healthy way. Evaluate your relationships or even yourself. Are you a part or in any kind of relationships? Like I've mentioned, family, but romantic, group, religious, spiritual, where if you express a difference of opinion in a respectful manner, are you met with shaming language? Are you encouraged to be quiet? These are red flags, not just because a person's not using the Socratic method, but because it discourages that independent self agency that we all have in that Truly, in my opinion, I believe we all need to survive. We all need to have those intact critical thinking skills in addition to the ability to understand why we believe what we believe and to respectfully advocate for ourselves and our beliefs. I'll try to run through these fairly quickly because there are quite a few, but there are about six categories of the different kinds of questions that can be helpful in Socratic questioning. Remember that you can use these questions on yourself, but then also with other people. So the first one is asking questions that require clarification. This is, as a mental health provider, one of my favorite forms of the Socratic method, seeking clarification. When you start to seek clarity on something, it can help the person create more definition. One of my favorite phrases is definition equates to clarity. If we define out our beliefs or why we think what we think or where that thought originated from, it can create clarity. It's really a cool process. I know I'm probably sounding like a total nerd here, but I get so excited about the Socratic method, but then also helping people find that sense of clarity. It's an empowering experience. The examples of clarity, clarification, seeking questions can look like, well, what made you say that? Where did that come from? What does that mean? How does this relate to what you said a few minutes ago? Really kind of gently probing, not in an argumentative way, but a, from a genuine place of seeking understanding. You can even ask yourself that. I know I said that before, but I gotta say it again. So if you are telling yourself unhealthy, unhelpful messages such as, well, I am a failure. I'm never going to be good at X, Y, and Z. Start to question that. What is making me say that? Where does it come from? How does it relate to who I am as a person? insert any kind of question that seeks to clarify that negative thought of self. Many times, if we just slow down a little bit and question where these automatic thoughts are coming from, 
it interrupts that process of just instantaneously accepting, okay, well, I thought I'm a failure. I am a failure. And it forces a person to challenge those negative thoughts or emotions that may be occurring. All right, the next set of questions are questions that probe assumptions. These can look like, can that statement be validated? What beliefs are assumed here? Might there be other agendas involved by those who are making these claims? This one is so important to me. Anytime we consume pretty much anything, there is some kind of agenda, whether it's a healthy agenda to spread education or awareness, or whether it's an agenda to push a person into a different or a new or a particular school of thought that goes into fostering what the agenda pusher wants to foster. This could be, you know, religious beliefs. This could be political beliefs, anything of that nature. But really questioning, are there other agendas involved by the person who's making these claims? Sometimes, not gonna lie, I will think that when I watch certain videos. You may think that when you watch my video, but I am curious. This person, it seems to have this very extremist point of view. What's their agenda? And, you know, just really kind of checking in and even creating your own internal hypothesis. Well, they maybe have controlling tendencies or they're looking to appear dominant or as if they have the one true way or insert whatever. But it can be a very powerful experience when you slow that process down and question what's making that person say that? What are they going after here? Not in a paranoid, everyone is out to get me way, but more so in an objective, let me question certain pieces of information I'm receiving here type of way, almost to flex that critical thinking muscle. That's an important distinction. Not trying to insert paranoia here by any stretch of the imagination, but more so just wanting to encourage anyone to be okay with asking questions, even if it is just to yourself. You're in a meeting at work. I have certainly done this where I questioned, well, why do we do whatever like this? Not to be a contrarian or argumentative, but honestly coming from a place of seeking understanding. And it's been interesting because sometimes it actually forces the manager uh, back at the time to review, well, why do we do this? You know, sometimes people get in those positions where they automatically just go along with whatever has already been in place for 20 or 30 years. And no one or many people haven't stopped to actually think, well, why do we have five meetings a week? Or why do we have to do this one piece of paperwork? What is going on here? So always good to ask. Next question is questions probing reasoning and evidence. This can look like, what do you think the causes are and why? What are those causes? Is there any evidence or facts that support this? How complex is the issue? If you've ever been in therapy, particularly dialectical behavioral therapy, or you have gone to a cognitive behavioral therapist, you may have heard similar lines of thinking. There is a DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy skill set called walking the middle line. And this is where a person is encouraged to walk the middle line between logical and emotional thinking. If a person gets too far rooted in logic, then they lose sight of the emotional side of things. And we have to have a healthy balance or this is what DBT postures, and honestly, I believe it, and this has been backed by research before, where having a healthy balance of logic and emotions can really enhance a person's life as well as assist them in better handling stressful situations. If we lead with our emotions, then this can sometimes breed anxiety or sadness or overwhelm. Your loss, think about a time where maybe you were feeling highly emotional. It can even distort clarity of thought when you're in those heightened emotional situations. Happens to the best of us from time to time, but this is where 
just knowing about these concepts can be helpful. Not to mention that emotional provocation can actually be a technique of manipulation employed by high control cultic group leaders and even abusive relational partners. If someone is able to utilize, let's say fear mongering, and or capitalize on someone else's heightened emotions, then they can convince that person that despite all of the fear or anxiety, they have the right way. And it really fosters that almost dependence that occurs in abusive relationships. So it's something to watch out for. And the other side of things, as I had been starting to say, but lost my train of thought, is that if we get too far rooted in logic, we can start to try to logic our way out of problems or we can intellectualize the problems or issues at hand. And this is not always helpful. If you always go straight to logic and remain far away from emotions, it can unfortunately cause a person to have trouble either relating to others or relating to the world around them. Not to mention that emotions are very important. They are vital to being in some ways a guide for ourselves. If you always feel bad after interacting with a person, place, or thing, then it's important to recognize those emotions and potentially start the questioning process, which then gives you the opportunity to take action on those emotions. But it is important to always consider what is that middle line for myself of being both cognizant of my emotions but not getting lost in them, but then also recognizing the logical or logic of a situation so that I don't get too far lost in the emotional side of things. The next set of questions are questions that probe perspective. This is also just so valuable, but asking things such as, is there another way to look at this? What are arguments to the contrary, if any? Can you provide an overall rationale? I'm gonna keep this going really quickly because I'm looking at my clock and seeing I've got 10 minutes before I need to go do something else. So let me go with the next set of questions and those are questions probing implications. So that would be what consequences can you see arising? Can a generalization be made? Now this is so important. This is almost establishing a pros and cons list or identifying what are the consequences if I decide to do X, Y, and Z. I think about joining uh, a business group again or joining a group in general. And many people maybe could think about the pros, I'll get a sense of community, potentially feel a sense of belonging, find my place in the world. But then it's challenging yourself. Well, what could the consequences be? Well, to be a part of this group, I have to pay, you know, $1,000 a month or I have to sign a non-disclosure agreement. Could there be consequences or fallout from engaging in those behaviors? Again, it forces a person to slow that process down, exercise a different part of the brain or a different way of thinking about something to find a person's own personal truth or find a person's own ability or healthy decision that feels good for them. All right, last but not least, then there are questions about the question. This can look like, why is this question relevant? What does this mean in practical terms? So that's just kind of the quick overview of different forms of Socratic questioning from the Socratic method, kind of encapsulates it nicely in my opinion. Last but not least, if you are interested in cognitive behavioral therapy, there is a great worksheet. This is free. It's a free resource. And there are so many other different worksheets to pull from this website. And it's called therapistaid.com. I am actually going to link this down in the description below. If you want to peruse this website by topic or uh, kind of problem area that you are looking to target, I believe they have some for kids, teens, adults. It's really a cool website and I love that they offer these for free, but I'm pulling from their worksheet called Socratic Questions. Again, there is a whole form of cognitive behavioral therapy that utilizes Socratic Questions and these fall right into that. So with this particular worksheet, you identify the thought that you're having that needs to be questioned or further examined. If you go to a cognitive behaviorist, uh, for individual therapy, then they're probably going to help you do this. So that is something immediately I try to tease out with individuals. Then it's understanding what is the evidence for this thought. 
for it or against it. This reminds me again of kind of utilizing that DBT and CBT skill sets of walking the middle line, but then also Socratic questioning, looking for concrete factual evidence to back up a belief that a person is having or alternately invalidate the belief that a person is having. Very helpful for anxiety or depression. Or potentially the messaging and teachings that are received from certain groups or organizations out there. So maybe for example, an evangelical church may put out the statement, women are only allowed to wear knee or ankle length dresses. And so you may question, well, why is that? What's the evidence to support that that's the right thing to do? Same with the new age spiritual group that postures going on an eight day juice cleanse. Where's the research to back up this efficacy? Then am I basing this thought on facts or in feelings? This allows a person to really identify is this a situation where I'm leading in with my emotions? Maybe this person is making all of these grand promises to me. They are giving me an inordinate amount of love and verbal affirmation, yet I just met them. I don't know them. Am I basing this current thought of joining a group on facts of getting real data of what it would be like from other members to join this group, the pros, the cons, or am I basing this on my own emotion and feeling swept up in the tide of happiness? So it's kind of identifying the distinction there and what's going on. I don't want to sound negative and I certainly don't want to talk anyone out of doing something that feels really happy and healthy for them. But I just think about all of my domestic violence survivors who I've worked with or individuals who have found themselves in a really abusive, coercively controlling relationship where in the beginning it did feel magical, but it was a sweeping up of emotions and that other person really capitalizing on their victim's emotions and telling them what they, they, want, they thought they wanted to hear. And so this is where Socratic questioning in all facets of life can just come in healthy, not necessarily to be a, a total skeptic, but just to flex that critical thinking skill set. Couple more quick questions from the therapist aid worksheet, but is this thought black and white when reality is more complicated? If you have ever been in a high control group, whether it's been religious, spiritual, new age, insert whatever, this is a question that they're going to flee from because in these high control groups and even high control relationships, it's always black or white. It's good or bad, you're with us, you're against us. But in actuality, is reality more complicated? Almost 99.9% .9 of the time, yes. Reality is going to be more complicated and there is going to be much more gray in between. And so even as just a common practice of identifying the gray in life can be helpful. It can even increase a person's ability to be more empathetic, to seek understanding on where someone else is coming from, to work through an ethical issue that may be presenting for someone and so on and so forth. Okay, there's a lot of questions here. So I just wanna go through through a couple more. Second, last but not least is, could I be misinterpreting the evidence? Am I making any assumptions? Those assumptions will always get a person, if not careful. If you assume someone doesn't like you, or you assume you're always going to be bad at X, Y, and Z, it can really cause a person to not take action on what otherwise could be a really healthy practice for them or a new hobby or a new job. And so really questioning, what are these assumptions that I'm having? Last but not least, am I looking at all the evidence or just what supports my thought? This helps to go ahead and break through what is called a confirmation bias or a bias in general? Am I looking at all the evidence or just seeking out information to support an already inherently held belief that I have? This one is tricky and it certainly requires a really deep look at what are my biases and identifying them and being honest with yourself if you have a certain belief that 
has either been instilled in you by someone else or maybe it's developed over the course of living on this planet. I really hope that this has been helpful. If you enjoyed this video, I think you might enjoy a previous video I did with a psychologist, social psychologist, and it is called Does My BS Detector Work? I'm gonna link it right up here. But as always, I hope you take really good care of yourself and be well.